Brew Strong is brought to you by Blickman Engineering, home of the Riptide. Visit them online at BlickmanEngineering.com. for the beer radio you've been looking for. This is the show that dispels myths, tackles the toughest topics, and makes no apologies for geeking out on beer. Hosted by two guys that drink before they think. Jamil Zainashev and John Palmer. This is Brew Strong. Hey, howdy, hey, my brewing brothers and sisters. Greetings, greetings. That's all you the folks out there. Make like a little noise. We are, we are live at Brew Chatter in uh, beautiful Sparks, Nevada, I want to say. Yep, Sparks, Nevada. Sparks, right next to Reno. It is like Reno's temple. It's right there. It's, you know, tightly attached. Yes? No? Yes. Right, yeah. Right. Or is temple offensive? No. Um, um, uh, appendage. <laughs> appendage. It's like the dangling uh, part of simple, I want to say, yeah. of, of, uh, of, uh, of Reno. Beautiful area. Wonderful place. And, and you were saying you've never been here before. Yeah, this is my first time. First, first time? time first time up in Reno? I think Reno first, area? Yeah. I mean, we went to Tahoe many years ago right? with John, our good friend. Yes. But, um, yeah, I, we haven't really graced Reno with our presence that I know. Right. I have. Well, oh, okay. I love I love it up here. I love Reno. I love the people up here are fantastic. It's 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 different than a lot of other places. Favorites, right? yep. People around here are just friendly, and you know, they also got their own like don't mess with me attitude. Yeah. But kind and generous is is absolutely the way to describe Reno and the, uh, the homebrew scene and the beer scene up here. It's fantastic. We went out to Revision Brewing last night. Right. Yeah, that was a good time. And just, just had a had a had a heck of a time. Um, we left with cases of beer, and uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. we tasted all sorts of special stuff and sours and everything else. It was it was like a giant party. And, it really uh, was a good time. Yeah, kind of fun. I mean, as you're saying, some of the local uh, people started bringing bottles out and sharing with us, and, and uh, yeah, yeah, met a bunch of folks. So yeah, so place. maybe we'll repeat that again tonight. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, I don't know where, but. Uh, uh, lots of fun. I also went by Shush Boom. Uh, Jason, friend of mine, uh, he he came by multiple times over the years to learn some stuff to open his place, and he's done an amazing job uh, building that place. I'm I'm really impressed with just the uh, the construction alone. Okay, well, we'll have to check that out. Too. Yeah, I had his alt beer. I thought it was delicious. Oh, nice. Um, you don't get alt very often. <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of pick the alt. Because you never see them on tap anywhere, right? right. But uh, yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. So, really great place to come and visit. If you've not been to Reno, come up to Reno, have some fun up here. Um, they got everything: yeah. gambling to breweries to big you know, hotels, big hotels. You got the Virginia City. I mentioned for Virginia oh, yeah. City. Yeah. Really cool, touristy little gold rush town. But they got historic things to look at as well. Uh, you know, speaking of historic things, uh, what kind of what aspect of history are you thinking of? <laughs> brewing history. Oh, okay. Home brewing history. history. Who's who's uh, really just made a major change to uh, homebrew through their innovation? I believe that would be our good friend John Blickman. That's right. If you have brew chatter, you can pick up cool things like the uh, the beer guns, the Blickman beer guns. Yeah. Uh, you know, really great guy. Great. Great bunch of folks that have uh, you know created a ton of cool ways to innovate your brew day. You know, all the the brew the brew kits, the, the beer labor time, saving equipment. The, yes, and uh, making your your beer day more fun, even, even without drinking. That's right. I don't drink during my brew day. How many people drink during the brew day? <laughs> it's pretty much, pretty much uh, everybody. Yeah. yeah, I know. I couldn't. Uh, right. Well, at least you can blame it on something. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, today, like I said, we're at uh, the lovely Brew Chatter. If you're up in Reno, you got to stop by. Best homebrew shop around. Lots of great fresh ingredients. Uh, wonderful uh, 
you know, gear, like flicking gear here. And most importantly, uh, the owners, uh, Josh and RJ. Um, like I said, I was at Shish Boom and I was talking to one of their guys there and they're like, I mentioned brew chatter. They're like, oh, we love those guys. They're so kind, so nice. They like called when they were closed, left a message and they're like, an hour later, they called me back and say, hey, what do you need? So people love you out there. They're good folks. You guys like Brew Chatter too, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. There you go. Huh? Huh? Yeah. Give it up for Brew Chatter. We kindly uh, flown uh, John out here. I drove. Yeah. And then uh, put us up in a hotel and everything else. Really, you know, first class treatment and really, really greatly appreciated. Yeah. It uh, really has been uh, easy trip. Lazy flight. Right. Um, and uh, yeah. I'm looking forward to today's show. Fantastic. Looking forward to hearing your questions and, and experiences. And, you know, You've got we... a sweet Blickman uh, cap on. I, yeah, I had not, I had not uh, noticed that until now. <laughs> yeah, it uh, keeps my ears warm. <laughs> <laughs> what about the rest of your head? It, it does it works well for the bald spot too. Actually. Yeah. yeah, there you go. That's where it's up in the mat. Yeah, really but, give you a little bald spot, a little room to breathe. Yeah. I, I figured it's like, oh, yeah, we'll be inside. I won't need my sweatshirt. And then, of course, the open garage door accessibility. Hey, and, I need uh, some air in here. I am a weak, delicate flower, and I need I need ventilation. I, I would think you'd need 70 degrees Fahrenheit as well. But <laughs> no, you're good. <clears throat> Speaking of logo gear, here's my, my latest shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this this became quickly became my favorite. Crappy beer makes baby <laughs> Jesus cry. Uh, nice. Yes, <laughs> that's nice. Uh, somebody, I, I started wearing it um, around around the holidays, and people would say, "Oh yeah, a great Christmas shirt." I'm like, "Yeah, I guess." <laughs> it doesn't mean I'm not going to wear it year round. Uh, yeah, crappy beer makes baby Jesus cry, which is that's, that's fact. That's it's just stating a fact. Yeah, I, I believe. It. Uh, one of the facts we can say uh, today, uh, our, our thought was we just get some questions from all you folks. So prepare your questions. Be, be ready. Yeah. And, well, the, uh, and the size of the crowd here today, Jimmy, I mean, you know, look at the thousands of people that crammed into the shop. I don't think I don't <laughs> think it's more than 5,000, but I do think it's it's yeah. probably it's huge. Cl- it's closing it's in. Tremendous. It's closing yeah. in on that. It is. It is a huge crowd. <laughs> Not to say you're all huge. You're you're. But you are many of you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, let's do this. Let's take a short little break. When we come back, we'll have uh, your questions live after this. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So, whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So, download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Are you looking for a simple brewing system that's great for all grain brewing, but everything on the market seems to be full of compromises? Blickman Engineering has the answer. The Blickman Brew Easy All Grain Brewing System. The Brew Easy is a complete system with easy upgrades and a beautiful compact design, perfect for any size brewing location. At its core, the Brew Easy is built on two gorgeous Blickman Boilermaker brew kettles, a high temperature March pump, and either a top tier gas burner or the new boil coil electric heater. The Brew Easy adapter lid allows the pots to stack on top of each other, forming an efficient, strong, and compact brewing setup that comes in 5, 10, and 20-gallon batch sizes. Upgrade your BrewEasy system with full automated control by adding a Blickman Tower of Power temp controller and make moving around easy with the Blickman Kettle Cart. The BrewEasy is modular. If you already own a Boilermaker kettle, you can build your BrewEasy by purchasing just the modules you need. The new BrewEasy all-grain brewing system. See it today at BlickmanEngineering.com and brew with Blickman quality on your new BrewEasy. Back to the two guys that know how to turn beer into beer. This is Brew Strong. All right, we're back. We're, we're live here at uh, Free Chatter. 
in Spartan, lovely Sparks, Nevada, where there's tons of breweries around. So if you come out here, not only do they have their little bar where they've got, uh, you know, five, six beers on, uh, and they're always, you just get any one of them, they're all delicious. I'm having the Sierra Nevada uh, uh, powder day. There you uh, go. Okay. Uh, Beer, uh, delicious, and you're having the alibi porter. Yeah, I was in more of a porter mood this morning. Well, you know, I'm telling myself this resembles coffee. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, um, let's 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 kick it off. Uh, who has a question here in the crowd? Come on, all right, step right up. What's your name? Mike. Mike, all right. So I've been uh, struggling with top aroma and uh, with my IPAs. So I was just wondering, you guys, what's your method? How do you achieve that? I mean, you guys are just at revision. They have some of the best top aromas on the right. IPAs right. in the world, I would argue. So, yeah. so what's the secret? I, I like to get my nose right down into the cup. <laughs> you know, that, then I get lots of pop on that one. But, um, yeah, there's, 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 a, there's a few a few tricks uh, to it. And... Uh, uh, one of them is uh, layering in different hops. So you want to you want to pick pick stuff that uh, you know you've got uh, you know various hop compounds. You know you know the the single hop thing works well if your malt bill is really low. You know the bigger your malt bill, the more character malt, malt you put in there. You know crystal and stuff like that. The harder it is to get that aroma out and, and the flavor. It really does tamp those things down. So. Try and make a, a lighter uh, beer, you know, just all base malt. You know, some of those really popping beers, it's all just base malt and uh, a bit of, you know, dextrose. And then that really lets the hop shine. Make sure that, you know, your, your finishing pH is correct. Your water is, is correct for what you want to do. All those things add a little bit to it as well. But uh, the main thing is that, and then, you know, picking a, uh, a, uh, a yeast that will, you know, expresses more hop aroma. That helps. And then, um, what else? Well, what, what well you... I guess to follow up with that, it's like in terms of the dry hopping and, yeah. you know, your techniques for when you actually dry hop or how much you're looking yeah. to dry hop for something like a, a revision IPA that has right, that right. nose. That's so, so amazing to me. I, I've always been trying to replicate that and okay. unable to. A couple, couple of things that help. One is... You know, in your whirlpool, all the, the hops that you're throwing in the kettle and all that, you know, first word and all that stuff, that doesn't do anything. Right. You can just skip all that. And you go, just whirlpool. And you you can get a surprising amount of bittering from the whirlpool. Just whirlpool. And you can take that whirlpool temperature down to maybe like 175 Fahrenheit. And you'll get a considerable bit more aromatic and flavor out of that. And then on the dry hop, what we've been doing at Heretic is we'll actually throw the dry, we'll wait until fermentation's over because we need to harvest the yeast, but then we'll throw the, the dry hops in and we will pump the tank around. We will circulate the tank for about, you know, three hours, you know, a little less than three hours. You don't want to do more than three or four hours. And that really extracts the maximum from the dry hopping. And then you can get rid of the dry hops. We let it settle overnight and then we dump them. Um, you don't need any longer than that for dry hopping. But uh, the recirculation. Yeah. 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 Agitation, you just swirl right. your fermenter. Your that's keg, whatever that's what I used to do, home brewing. And I didn't know, you know, why I was doing it. But I thought, well, it would kind of stir the hops up into suspension, I'd get more out of them. So I'd dry hop in like a car boy. And then I got this technique of rocking it and I could swirl everything up into the, into the, uh, into the column. Uh, beers I wanted to attenuate a bit more and swirl the yeast up that same way. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so you don't have to pump it around necessarily if you're doing a car boys or buckets or something like that. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're big ass fermenters, 120 barrel fermenters, you need to, uh, you need to pump it. Well, but I actually have a like rip tie, so I can probably. There you go. Nice. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right. Cool. You ever drink cocktails? Yeah. All right. Uh, your prize for being the first person bold enough to step up and ask you a good question is a right. uh, four pack, a uh, mixed pack of uh, some heritage cocktails. All right. Thanks, sir. Yeah. There you go. There you go. See, the rest of you shouldn't be so shy. <laughs> you would have won. 
a question about the, the cocktails. Yes. So when you do those, do you do do you do the uh, like the base whiskey, vodka, gin to that and add juice when you're canning those, or do you actually do the full distillate and just distill it with all those flavors and then can it right from the still? A good question about uh, you know how the process of making ready to drink cocktails and cans. Um, <clears throat> If it's like all the flavors go in, then you distill it, or you distill and then add the flavors. It's the it's the latter. You distill and then add the flavors because the distillation process it, it depends on what you're doing because you will get some of the character of the things you throw in to distill. So um, when they do stuff like uh, you know apple pie or something like that, a lot of times they'll add the apples or the apple juice and then they'll distill that with the with the um, corn or whatever to, to get some of that flavor in there. Um, but uh, the way that we're doing these cocktails is they're made like traditional cocktails. So you make the spirit first and then just like a bartender would, we'll assemble, um, you know, uh, whatever it is for a lemon drop, we'll do the sugar, the, the lemon juice, all that stuff. And we'll do all that in a, in a tank, a large tank. We'll, carbonated if need be and then uh we'll go ahead and transfer it out and package it up so it takes about three days to make a, a tank full of uh cocktails and package it um beer takes three and a half weeks yeah so there's a huge time and labor savings with cocktails if, you, if you're if you're opening a a brewery, consider open a distillery instead, or a distillery <laughs> and a brewery. But the margins are much higher on, on cocktails. The, the labor is far less. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a great thing. You know, the, the industry right now, beer is suffering. Craft, craft brewers are suffering right now. Um, there's, there's some downward pressure on the market. There's pricing pressure. Uh, the cost of everything is skyrocketing. Um, so it's it's a real struggle, um, but uh, you know, with with the cocktails, uh, you save a ton of labor, and you uh, you know you have a longer shelf life, and um, your your time to produce is is much less. Interesting. Do you actually make the, the spirits that the heretic or do you? Yeah. Like so them? well, we do both. So okay. we'll 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 make spirits um, that we'll use for. You know, our flavored vodkas, we'll make spirits for our whiskeys from our all from our beer, we put in barrels, all that stuff. When we do the majority of, uh, uh, you know, vodka based uh, cocktails, we'll just buy the vodka. So we found a really good supplier, high quality stuff, and it's just vastly cheaper to have somebody big produce it for you than on our, we have a hundred and uh, 70 gallons still, we can run about 150 gallons out of it at a time. And so, you know, it takes quite a while and you get not a whole lot. So for bottled spirits, it makes sense. But for, uh, for a cocktail, yeah. Yeah. Need more. yeah. Good question. All right. Uh, I will give you, I will give you a choice um, of beers. Um, <clears throat> there's worry. That's a two year old Chardonnay barrel aged, uh, Golden Golden, the juicier now, which you, you mentioned, gotcha. uh, really enjoy. the caramel Mucchiato, which is uh, like a, a caramel macchiato at Starbucks, except it's beer, and our shallow grade or wine port. Please choose. Oh, wise man, took the, the ten dollar a can worry. <laughs> <laughs> nice, it is delicious. All right, good question, man. And I'm sorry, what was your name? Chris. Chris. All right. Mike and Chris helping the show uh, succeed. Um, do you have a question from our, our, our listeners? Yes, I do. And and if you if you want to have us answer questions, you can always uh, come to an event like this at, at Lovely Brew Chatter, or you can uh, email them in to uh, uh, brewstrong at thebrewingnetwork.com. Yeah. I'm not sure if we ever answered this one before, but it was towards the top of the list, so I'll yeah. give it a shot. Mike asks, uh, I have two questions regarding cons uh, considering pooling the beer, specifically Vienna lager, after diacetyl rest. Hmm. 
I know that cooling too rapidly can cause the yeast to express heat shock proteins lowering the quality somebody, of the beer. Somebody who clearly uh, uh, read the, the yeast book. Yep. Currently, my routine is cooling the beer at a rate of about 0.7 C every 12 hours. It's about a degree and a half towards two degrees. Yeah, um, that's fine. Then I lager my beer for a few weeks, and then often I reuse the yeast. Uh-huh. Is that cooling rate safe? Yeah. Yes. If I rack my beer first or at some time during cooling to separate it from the yeast sediment, can I cool the beer more rapidly? What rate would not jeopardize beer quality? So, at uh, at Heretic, what we do, and what I did as home brewer was uh, I would go like a couple degrees a day, whatever. It, it just depends on how much of a hurry I was in. Uh, but at Heretic, we'll do three degrees in the morning. Morning guy comes in, reduces temp by three degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, Reduces by three degrees Fahrenheit on the settings. Okay. And that way, uh, we're doing about six degrees Fahrenheit per day. It's about 3C. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. that's that's fine. You, you end up the real clean lager that way. Yeah. You just don't want to go too fast because uh, what it does is there's some precursors of uh, esters that the yeast are still kind of working through. Yeah. And they'll, they'll have internally. And then if you crash chill it, they will express that, in a, you know, as they rapidly go towards you know, survival mode. Yeah. Makes so you sense. Take, it, take it slow and easy. Yeah. Um, the same thing happens when you're trying to, uh, you know, make starters, make healthy yeast. You know, the, that temperature drop actually helps in that case. It makes them, you know, bundle up their glycogen reserves. And, oh, yeah. So there's a point at the starter where if you're trying to grow yeast, like the commercial yeast, uh, there were growers do. There, there's a certain point in fermentation where they crash chill it and it causes the yeast to kind of like, you know, bundle up. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, they have their temperatures. They got all their own their thing. Yeah. A lot of the, you know, I know that we, we throw out a lot of numbers and generally we're trying to be conservative. We're trying to kind of put a best practice out there, yeah. a guideline, um, you know, three degrees every 12 hours. Yeah, that's really safe. That's you fine. could probably go higher. And, and really, we also overgeneralize about the yeast itself. Like this is a number that works for all yeast. When there sure. really is a lot of individual uh, character to different Experience. strains. Yeah. And um, so I think even if you had doubled the, you know, these, these uh, cooling rates, you'd probably still be fine. Uh, it, again, it can depend on which yeast strains you're using, um, how healthy that fermentation was to begin with, you know, and a number of factors. Right. So, um, you know, I guess my my the point I'm trying to make is... Uh, What's the point you're trying to make, Jeff? This is not... We're not spouting gospel. We're spouting guidelines. I, I don't know about you, but I'm spouting gospel. You are, you are the Pope. I, I am true. known as the Pope. Yes, uh, that's yeah. true. All right. Oh, just I've got a I've got a trivia question uh, for everybody. Uh, what is John Palmer's uh, uh, nickname? I'm called the Pope. Uh, Mike McDowell is called Tasty. What is John Palmer's nickname? You say Palmer's? Yes, so you say the Palmer's. <laughs> As known on the Brewing Network. Oh, come on! Somebody's got to know it. Mm-hmm. Got some young folks here. No, no, no. Oh. I don't know. Friends of Porter, <laughs> you can, you, you, you certainly can. Uh, and, and y'all remember Casey? Casey. Um, y'all uh, can pull out your phone and, and Google it. I don't care. <laughs> it's John Palmer's nickname. All right. Uh, <clears throat> let's see here. Let's take another quick short break. Okay. And when we come back. A lot more of your questions right after this. Learning to brew has never been so disgusting. This is Brew Strong.
All right, we're back. We're down here in the beautiful uh, Brew Spark- Chatter land. Yep, Sparks, Nevada, home of bighorn sheep, uh, caribou, and penguins. <laughs> penguins? Yes, I think that sounds that sounds correct. That sounds accurate. To me. Uh, all right, another question from the assembled multitudes. Yes. Can you explain your process for yeast harvesting in sure. a commercial environment as well as a home environment? Yes. Uh, That's a great I got time for a full show. No problem. Uh, what's your <laughs> name? Chris. Chris. Good question. Um, so home brewing, what I did was I'd wait for the, the yeast to flocculate. You know, uh, you can see it in a, you know through a carboy. You know, the, the yeast, the, the beer is cloudy, and that starts to clear, and that yeast falls to the bottom. If you harvest too soon, um, you're getting the most flocculent yeast that you know the yeast had dropped out first, and they don't attenuate as much. So you want to catch some of those later yeast. You don't want to get all those later yeasts um, because some of them stayed in suspension. Too long, you know, petite mutants and things like that. That could less flocking. Less flocking, you end up starting selecting for really a haze producing yeast. Um, so <clears throat> I would wait for it to settle out. I would transfer the beer to uh, a, a corny keg for, for carbonation. And then I'd shake the carboy up, you know, the last little bit of liquid that's in there. You take out pretty much all the beer. You know, it's impossible to get all of it out. There's always enough to, to shake up the yeast. If not, you can take, uh, you know, sterile water, you know, that's been boiled and cooled and pour that in there if you need, and then use that to shake it around and break up the yeast. And then I transfer it all into like liter size, two liter size, uh, what I call Nalgene poly, polypropylene uh, containers that are sterile. Pour it into there. Uh, shake it up really well, uh, add some water, shake it up really well. And then what you see fairly quickly is um, you know, the brown hoof, you know, the brown little chunks and uh, dead yeast, all that will fall in the bottom and form a little dark layer down there. And then up at the top, you'll see kind of a really light, creamy uh, color uh, layer that's a lot of uh, you know dead yeast hulls and things like that. Yeah. So... Once I got that to separate out, I would decant off the top, throw that away. Then I would transfer the nice, creamy, suspended, suspended yeah. yeast layer in the middle, pour that to another container, and then throw away what was at the bottom. So by doing that, I've separated out the, you know, the, the, the dead crap on the bottom and the, you know, the floaty stuff, the on, floaty top. stuff on top. It just kept the good stuff. Because there's way more yeast than you need. So don't be afraid to, you know, decant off and, you know, clean that up. And you can do that multiple times if you want. Mm -hmm. Just use regular tap water. You want some minerals in there. Um, You know, no chlorine. Uh, You know, you boil it or you can can it to get get yourself some, uh, you know, some, some sterile water and then that. In the professional arena, commercially, what we do is... Um, we just transfer in, in our scenario at Heretic, we transfer tank to tank to a sterile, we sterilize the loop with hot water and then, uh, or pasteurize a, a loop with hot water. And then, uh, we open up from one tank, we transfer over. So we'll, we'll do a similar thing where we'll drop the initial stuff out of the tank because it's got a whole lot of dead stuff that dies quickly and you want that middle cut. So the cone will, will fill up. And the top is the least flocculent. A lot of really bad stuff is on the bottom. So you want to get out of the middle. If you transfer too fast, if you pull too fast, you'll you'll pull through, and you'll just get a tunneling effect of the beer through the center of the, that that yeast mass. You won't you won't really get what you want. So you need to transfer slow enough for that. Pull off the bottom, dump it. We um, have flow meters that count. Uh, you know, the amount, and we also have a lab. We test the, you know, concentration of the yeast, uh, cells per mill. Then we know how many mills we need to pump through the, uh, through the flow meter. And that's how we, that's how we pitch. A lot of, 
breweries, they will harvest the yeast off of their tanks and hold it in a uh, separate tank, a uh, yeast brick uh, that's on load cells, and then they'll pitch by weight. They have new modern uh, 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 products that will uh, count the amount of cells for you and buy them before you as it, as it pumps through, and you punch in essentially how much yeast you want, how much live yeast you want for that. Uh, but we don't, we don't have one of those. Like I said, we just use a flow maker because those things are expensive. I'm terribly cheap. And, uh, you know, it's kind of the way it goes. Good question, Chris. Well, I have one additional piece to that. So I'm oh, using a conical. A two-parter. Yes. Yeah, a conical. A yes. A home conical. And I want to, I've been reading about this harvesting and they talk about the word washing. I don't understand the washing. Is that what you're right. talking about? Adding clean water? And right. So there's yeast washing and there's yeast rinsing. The old washing thing was uh, you would add enough acid to kill off the bacteria, but not quite kill the yeast. Because yeast can withstand a lower pH than the bacteria can. And so that was washing. You'd Take your yeast, you add the acid, all that stuff. You know, assuming you had a, uh, uh, you played it out, you found contaminants to it, you do that. I don't recommend doing that. If you if there's contamination of that yeast or you're worried about there's contamination of that yeast, I would just throw that pitch away and get yourself a new pitch. It's not worth doing that because uh, you're risking, um, you know, contaminating future batches. That's not worth holding on to. Rinsing is just adding sterile water, shaking it up, and letting the natural, uh, you know, weight differences on the yeast pop into the top and pop to the bottom. That's rinsing, um, and it's super easy to do. You know, if you're if you're already harvesting yeast and you know making clean containers, it's a good way to go. It's kind of like an Oreo cookie. Stuff in the middle. Yes, you want the creamy <laughs> middle. You don't want the cookie on the bottom or the cookie on the top. Perfect. Good point. Thank you. All right, Chris. Uh, you are a winner. What would you like? Well, most uh, of the people beers? here know who I am, and I don't like hop steps. Right. All and then, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Do you guys ever just like do direct pitch, like when you're brewing, just track off of one and direct pitch from the next? Cone to cone? Yes. The, yeah, yeah, so that's we, what I we do cone to cone at in Harrison. Um, we measure it, but it's still cone to cone. Um, you know, like I said, you can put in extra tanks and, um, uh, you know, collect the yeast and then pitch off of weight out, out of that, that slurry in the tank. Um, that's what a lot of breweries do as well. Um, there's other methods, but Generally, we like to do, you know, tell the company. It's just, it's cheaper, it's more effective. We get that, we'll get that. <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What's your, your thoughts on that? Huh? How many generations do you use on that? Oh, generations of yeast. Yeah, so uh, generally, we want to kind of hold it into 10 to 15 generations. Um, we've gone into the 20s, and then breweries go into the 100s. Um, and the yeast kind of drifts along with what they do, but we like what, what the yeast companies give us. And so we, we tend not to go more than 10 to 15. So, um, the, the thing is, it's not just 10 to 15 batches. It's, you know, cause we'll have a, a, a pitch of yeast off of a tank. That first pitch or that will start up a new pitch of yeast. It generates, you know, four to five times more yeast than you put in. So from that, we could pitch, you know, another three or four other batches. Generally you're throwing some away. You know, you get two to three batches that you will, you could disseminate it out to. That's only one generation, but you've got two to three batches. And it's like, you know, the old shampoo commercial or whatever it was, <laughs> friends, get two friends, whatever. So from those, you can do the same thing again. And so you can do, you know, hundreds of batches within 10 to 15 generations. So that's what drives the, the price up because a pitch of yeast, you know, we're talking fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars for a pitch of yeast. Um, and so we have to, you know, kind of 
spread parse out. that out, spread spread that pain out across you know as many batches as we can. And so that drives it down to where we're, you know, not, you know, paying more than, you know, twenty, thirty dollars a batch or so. Uh, really helps uh, you know, lower the cost. The, 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 the beers get better and better. Uh, Acting like the work starts. Yeah, to definitely. Work faster. Yeah. As um, they used to, if you see a spot where the yeast will, the yeast cake will start to go to like, you could see it starting to get tired. Yeah, I mean, you what you see is so one of the things that we do is we'll measure, you know, pH and the, and the gravity, you know, each day, and they will they will form a curve for every beer, uh, every yeast, every beer that is really consistent. Every time you brew it, those numbers should be pretty much exactly what they were before. Every time you do it. And if you see it start to trend a different way, it's like it's taking a lot longer to get to the drop um, or you know, change pH. It's taking longer to get to those those terminal numbers. Then you know that that pitch is you have a problem with that pitch. Maybe you you collected you collected the, the yeast too early and you're reusing too much of the early stuff versus the later stuff. Um, so it's 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 kind of in there. Um, uh, forget what your original question. Yeah, <laughs> right, it's just on the, on the yeah. How do you know when it's done? Right. Down. How do you know? How do you know how many? Right. So, uh, yeah. Uh, when I was home brewing, I mean, I could see a huge difference around you know generation three, where uh, you know really just everything fermented perfectly, gravities were right, everything you know, and the flavor was right. Um. So I always like generation three, four, and five the most. Yeah, I think I got one of the six. Right. Last year, I got And home brewing, the problem is it's hard to do, you know, uh, sanitary transfers, you know, so you end up getting some exposure. So you really don't want to go too deep into, into that in your home brewing. If you have all closed transfers, everything you do growing is closed. Um, and then you can do it, you know, commercially. That's why you can take it further. Um, and then nutrients, a lot of different things. It's easier to, to pitch, you know, your, it's all proportional, but still, you know, it's a giant cone of yeast. It's easier to kind of select that, that perfect center um, commercially. So, uh, yeah, that's, you know, what we do. Yeah. I, I just like, Hearing, hearing how y'all do this is uh, good details. Right, right. Um, and you know, we learned a lot over the years uh, you know, about about the, the best methods of, of doing things. And that's one of the, the great things about commercial brewing is you are you can repeat experiments and, and techniques, and you can make tweaks to them because you're you're seeing the results, you know, almost daily. And you're brewing every day. You, yeah. you, you see results every day. So we're able to do tests. Of, okay, I want to do this. I want to try this nutrient. I want to change this this measurement. You know, when you're home brewing, it's hard to have that many iterations of a beer. It, you know, you, it, it it you know takes a lot. So um, uh, you know, commercial brewing. That's one of the things I really loved about it is. Be like, all right, we're going to make this change. We're going, to, we're going to try this, see what happens. And you know, for some of the beers, like we made, uh, you know, a huge amount of make America juicy again. So if we did like a thirty barrel batch and tried a new technique or a new hop or whatever, and it wasn't exactly the same as as the hundred twenty barrel batch, well, we could just blend it in. I mean, it, it, you know, any changes pretty much disappear. You, you know, if it's evident, it's like a quarter of that. The changes we did, we, you know, were generally for the better. And we, you know, like, oh, yeah, that's that's nice. All right, let me blend that in and then let's start shifting to doing that, you know, on future batches. Yeah, well, I know you'd said that with the uh, juicier now that um, you worked quite a while stabilizing the haze. Hmm. You know, what were, the, what were some of the practices that you were able to implement to help do that? Right. Um, the, so, a number of things. 
getting something that is hazy all the time is it's water. It's the right amount of, you know, oats and wheat. Um, you can do too much and okay. that fights you and it starts Causes making the beer more clear again. Yeah. It almost acts like findings. Yeah. So you don't want to do too much. You don't want to do too little. You, um, uh, so it's, it's, it's really the, uh, th those, those grains, it's the water. It's, um, also doing the whirlpool and, uh, recirculating the dry hop, uh, does a much better job of building those protein tannin complexes okay. that, you know, are permanent A's. So you get the right amount of hops, right amount of grains, you recirculate the whole thing, stir it all up. And, um, and then the, the, the water, the pH makes a difference. Okay. And you can get something really uh, tremendously. Uh, somebody sent in a question about that and asked for a show about how to make, you know, the best Nipahs. And uh, we should do it. Yeah. Uh, get all my, my, my details and numbers down and uh, we can get very specific advice out of it. Okay. So when you, when, you talk, when you said the water just now, with, is that in regard to the water chemistry or the water to grist ratio? Water, water chemistry. Okay. So the right, right mineral content, um, you know, getting the right pH. A lot of it gives that softness, um, you know, adding salt. I and mean, we really don't add salt to any beer but the hazies. So, you know, regular old table salt. Yeah. Um, what would be the right pH to get something to, to stay hazy? Uh, somebody did a study recently about pH and haze, um, maximum haze. And what was it? The, the, the lower it was, the more hazy it was or the, or the higher it was? It's, it's, higher. It's, all the, it's all in the four range. Yeah. You want it acidic. You want it to be pretty acidic. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, it, I ended up reading it and I was just like, well, yeah, it's really not. It didn't make much sense to me. You know, it's kind of like, okay. Uh, you want to be in that standard beer range of, you know, four to around, five. yeah, four, as low as four, two, as high as four, seven. You want to kind of be in the middle, like four, four. Our water is like seven, four, eight. Right. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty. You have to, pretty. you have to add, you know, uh, some adjustments to the water. You want to get your, your pH generally down your around pH. five, your, your, uh, your mash pH, like five, two to five, three. Uh, at the end of the mash, the end of the boil, you want to be around five. Fermentation should take you down into the lower fours. Uh, you get good proper fermentation. Dry hopping will drive it back up. And, and then if you need, you can always add a little bit more acid to kind of bring it back down. Yeah. All right. And since you're on the pH uh, question trade, uh, I don't use it. I always adjust it using minerals, but the spike to yeah, five, four, two, yeah, they got that shelf and I saw that. Right, the five, two. I'm huge fans of that. Right. Um, because it just depends on you know so many things. John can speak more to the to, to five, two, but um, you know, I I I don't recommend five, two because it's too much of a band aid. You know, well, a, a cure all. When, it works. Yeah, it works, but you, have, you often have to add a lot of it. And if you take the time to understand what the water is, what your what the mineral composition of your brewing water is, and where it should go, then you can do the specific mineral adjustments to get you there, rather than relying on a lot more of this band aid. Um, so. Yeah, it's it's I don't know, kind of a blunt instrument approach to a problem that deserves more finesse. Yeah. Yes. It's on the same point, but not a situated malt or freaking pH. A situated malt is in yeah. case people couldn't hear on the microphone. He was asking, Well, what's your name? Yeah. Dan's asking about a situated malt for adjusting your pH. Yeah. What a situated malt's good. Um uh one percent in the grain bill for about a one tenth pH drop. Um, so yeah, if you mash, you know, base malt typically mashes in at around 5.8. Um, then you add in your water factors, you may get down to five, six, or you may bump up to five, nine or six, depending on where you are. 
Um, essentially, the malt will help that drop a couple tenths. Um, essentially, you know, it's it's base malt with lactic acid coating. Right. So, uh, yeah, it, it works. It's a good natural tasting acid um, at, you know, one, five percent, even seven percent. It's not really going to affect the, the flavor of your beer. Well, much. you know, the, the whole the whole reason for the sigillated malt is for the Germans, for the Rhein Heights right? Right. They couldn't add lactic acid. But if they had malt that had lactic acid on it from, you know, Production. a mashing process, then they were allowed to add that. So a lot of times it's easier just to use liquid lactic acid. It's the same thing. And then you're not messing with trying to adjust uh, your your total grist ratio and getting the right amount of grist in there. And then if, if, if you didn't hit the right mash pH, you don't want to throw in a bunch more grist trying to drive it down. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's why I kind of preferred the lactic acid. Um, we, at, at, on the commercial level, a lot of people use phosphor. It's stronger. It's more, um, flavor neutral, flavor neutral. And it's got more, uh, acidifying, uh, power. And so, uh, you use something that's, you know, 85% phosphoric and it really it takes very little and there's very little flavor. flavor in it. But lactic is a, is a great option. Yeah. Good question. Did you want a beer, Dan? Sure. <laughs> GC it now. There you go. All right. You guys are such a lively crowd. You make, <laughs> you make, so, much, you make so much noise. <laughs> yeah. It really is great. I appreciate everybody coming down and supporting yeah. our, our great sponsor, Free Chatter. It's nice to know that people actually listen to the show, you know, and right. hear what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. I've always not believed that. I, I always thought there was actually no listeners that we were <laughs> not, they were not really posting these on the internet and that we were just fooling ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. That's what my children tell me. You know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Dad, you're fooling yourself. Yeah. Oh, I got another question. Uh, I mean, I mean, homebrew is your silver carbonate or something under carbonate. How do you kind of reduce carbonic acid uh, effect on your beers? Mm. Silver carbonate? Is there a way? I, oh, I don't think carbonic acid is an issue. Um, over carbonate, I mean, it does beer? it does play a, a role in the the overall impression of the beer. Higher carbonation, right. yeah, yeah, but it's not as acidic as you know uh, some of the other things we're talking about. Right. Yeah, car taking your beer to a carbonation of say two volumes or three or volumes, even four volumes. Yeah, you're going to get um, like 0.05 difference in pH. It's uh, it, you know half of a tenth. So um, carbonated versus uncarbonated when you when you check measuring pH. Um, so yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, carbonic acid in itself is not going to contribute much flavor but the effect of carbonation on your beer especially in competition can be significant um and usually it's a case of under carbonation coming in right. where you're tasting a beer and it just feels flabby and it's like in, you're right on the score sheet you know if you just had more carbonation i think this would have been livelier would have scored better right, right um you know rarely when we get an overcarbonated beer into competition, you know, you know, are we going to let that bring the beer down? Oh, but I'll tell you this. Um, a lot of judges who don't know anything about judging beer, <laughs> yeah. when they see something that's, you know, overcarbonated, they assume it's infected. Right. Yeah. So that may or may not be the case. You know, um, <clears throat> most of the time when you get a gusher on the table, yeah. it's got some sort of problem. Um, but you know, you can over carbonate something too and have it be clean and, and clear, but yeah, you know, there's people that they, in their mind, it's infected. So that can be dangerous in competition. That well. can. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I know better. You know better. <laughs> <laughs> the two of us know better. Uh, right, right, right. That's a good question. I'm sorry. What was your name? Brent. Brent? Uh, one last beer here for you. <laughs> Thank you. Enjoy. 
It's our oh. shallow grave quarter. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. I think it's time for one last break. Okay. Sounds good. Oh, I don't have all my little tricks yeah. uh, to do here. Okay. My little timers and notes and all that stuff. So I'm just going off of uh, my mental, mental acuity. Plug. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it's called, right? Uh, so we'll take another short break, and when we come back, we'll have more of your questions right after this. Back to the beer guys that make other beer guys look like wine guys. Brew strong. All right, we're back. <laughs> I was Who's, who came up with the robust porter of the black widow? Oh, the black widow, the robust porter? Yeah. Um, so. Who's is that? John's or that yours? No, that's two mills. Yeah. yeah. That's two mills? That's, yeah. Uh, all, the, all the recipes in the book are mine, um, it, with the exception of, you know, something from like Tasty, something with Mike Riddle. You know, I have a few in there. Um, uh, 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 Steve Christian. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, the the nice identified. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the Black Widow Porter, um, really, that's my recipe. But the foundation of it was from our good friends at uh, More Beer down in the in the uh, Bay Area, California. Um, I went in and I had been um, brewing, uh, you know, chocolate hazelnut porter and you know, a couple other things. And I was using like a, I think I started off a kit or something like that. And I wanted to make my own porter. I was really getting into porters. I loved uh, Black Butte Porter from Deschutes. I thought it was fantastic. And so I went in and uh, Chris Graham there, I was like, hey, I want, you know, an all grain, you know, I was, there was extract and, and specialty grains. So I, I said, I want to do an all grain porter, robust porter. And he was like, let me take you to Regan, Regan Dillon. Uh, who worked there for a long time. Um, Designed I, a leather. I assume he's still alive. I don't know. He could be. Um, but he really was into porters. And off the top of his head, he rattled off a porter recipe that was mainly like baseball and a couple, two or three crystals and, you know, some Munich and some other stuff. And that was the recipe that I started with, uh, all grain. And then I made some tweaks to it and adjusted it. And, uh, kind of dialed it in for, for what uh, became the Black Widow Porter. And the Black Widow Porter, I remember uh, I went out to brew and, man, there were Black Widows like coming out of the hoses or thing. It was, uh, that's that's why it's called Black Widow Porter. Um, but, uh, yeah, that and then the, the beer that uh, Brent just got, the Shallow Grape Porter, is essentially that recipe but simplified for commercial brewing. So commercial brewing, you know, storing like a ton of different, you know, specialty malts and, you know, measuring them out in, you know, weird portions. It's like I changed it to like one crystal malt, everything in sacks. You know, you either do a full sack or a half sack. That's how commercial brewers work. They don't tend to, unless it's something, maybe like, you know, roasted barley or something like that, you'll do you'll weigh it out in weird portions and not do a full sack, but anything else you want to do it in full sacks or half sacks, because it's just such a nightmare to store all these little partial sacks of, of malt. Yeah. So the only complaint I have about that recipe. Yeah. My cat goes empty. So goddamn. <laughs> so <bad. laughs> it really will cause a hole in the keg. Okay. I think that's, no, that's, no, I mean, that's the, you that's start the with five gallons and that goes, too quick, so then I go to ten gallons and I goes quicker. How the hell that happen? There you go. I mean, that's definitely just especially this time of year. I've seen I've seen that happen. It's, it's, it's a great beer to have right now. This time of year. How many, how, many, how many people here have brewed something from brewing plastic stuff? Oh, oh, nice. See, not everybody. No, not everybody. So many people with pikers. For the most, and Dr. Homer, I've done a couple of his out of his book, too. 
Right. Right. So I like them. You guys got great recipes. I mean, you can't go wrong. Right. Yeah. I think one of the advantages is. It's a single source of recipe, so you you know that if you need to make certain changes to fit your desire on one type of beer, those changes probably apply to all those oh, different recipes. Exactly. I've done some changes with with um, the red and right, some right. others. I mean, that's red's kind of fallen out of favor, but that's still one of my favorite beers. Oh I mean, yeah, me too. You know, and I every time I I can't tell my kid anymore that I've got a red. Because <laughs> son of a bitch would come over and drink my keg, you know. <laughs> so, there you go. And then they won't come over for a couple months. So I just you know, <laughs> like get another one. So. Right. Um, yeah, it's it's nice to have something that's consistent that you can kind of you know riff off of from there. Uh, that's one of the reasons I think that uh, really proud about the great plastic styles we did. Yeah, and the guys got it during the Weizenbach too for Halloween. I think. Oh yeah, that's so, a great one. That's I, a great Halloween beer. Oh, I, I, I almost brought some down for you. Nice, but I'm only down to one or two glasses left, so sorry <laughs> about that. <laughs> can't can't you know pour it down the sewer of, oh. of John and I. You well, know, well, if I would have had more, oh, I would have, but I do have a double also. Nice, I've got it from here right to watch it. It's been kegs, and I'm. I like to let it sit for about three, four months before I drink it. Okay. And that, oh God, it just, your guys' recipe on that is so damn good. All right. I got a question for you all. How many people have been brewing less than a year? Raise your hand. How many people <laughs> less than two years? Less than three? Less than five? Less than 10? Just barely. <laughs> Less than fifteen. I'm right around there. Anybody? Anybody? Twenty years. Who's who's brewed more than twenty years? Wow. Uh, thirty years. <laughs> really? You're not that old. Don't, don't be lying to me. <laughs> I, remember, I remember being a little kid and reading his book. <laughs> <laughs> With a highlighter. How long have you been brewing? Thirty years in this year. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. The, the war kind of got me. Right, right. <laughs> I've, uh, how long have I been doing? Yeah, 33, something like that. I have? Mm -hmm. Damn, that's a long time. <laughs> yeah, we both started like uh, what, just around right 1990, 88. No, I think I was like 10 years later. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, I, I, I think I started. I really don't have a whole lot of idea you know but uh my wife may know but i think it was around 99 oh, okay. 19 and 99 okay that's about 10 years wife's always okay. yeah. yeah no i think when we first met you were already uh oh, like had your your you self-published how to brew by that okay. time yeah because we met at uh mcab in berkeley right right and I already uh, knew. I was already a little like, oh, John, you're so special. Let me, let me sit next to you. Yeah. Well, that's why we're here, because both of you are here. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. You struck up a friendship back then. and Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, the it's never really become anything, but, you know. Well, yeah. Being a Berkeley, that kind of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's there's quite, the, quite the group there that weekend. I mean. Um, our friend Dave Sapsis. Dave Sapsis. There was um, a genius of uh, yeah. Uh, shoot, now of course his name escapes me. But I think John Tall may may have been there too. Yeah, yeah, he was there. Yeah, and um, Fritz Maytag. Fr Fritz was there. Uh, Talked to him. Ray and Daniels our, and uh, George Fix. Was George there. Fix. That's what I was trying to think of. Yeah, George. First time that George Fix. Yeah. And uh, oh, some some of the BJ, original BJCP members were there. Um, yeah, well, I'm terrible, man. Oh yeah, um, um, the guy who used to do the um, uh, Scott the uh, the, uh, the barley wine festival in, in San Francisco. His name was Josh. Good, you guys are <laughs> terrible at names. I don't feel that bad now. Yeah. You guys both go to Davis. To the, to the Davis no. no. You went to MIT or where did you? No, I went to Michigan Tech. 
Michigan Tech. I went to uh, UCH, but I did not study beer there. I studied yeah. microbiology and writing. Your <laughs> stuff. Yes. Yeah. Oh, cool. uh, Davis is a great school. And there's something about just being there that makes you end up making beer. <laughs> Any other questions before we wrap this up? Uh, right. In Reno, we always had the Strange Brew Fest. It's been like three years since we had it. Strange Brew uh, Fest. Yes. Yes. Three years, oh, Strange Brew totally was sure. like marshmallows and limes. But marshmallows now, and limes. Yeah, in the yeah. same beer? Yeah. 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 But what nice. would be your guy's strange brew that you would want to make the syrup to the public? Hey, that was my question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, hmm, wow. That's a good question. What do you do? Oysters? I have one going in it. I tell you, just recently, I brewed a beer with persimmon. I had never, I had actually, I don't think I ever eaten a persimmon before. And uh, the, the friend of mine, uh, Tony uh, at a, he owns a, a, a brewery or a, a, a pub. Um, he had a bunch of persimmons and he brought some over and man, just took my knife out, sliced, sliced them up and just absolutely delicious. Who's eating a persimmon? They're better frozen. <laughs> right. A lot of people don't eat persimmons because you hear bad things about them. But I tell you, when they're fully ripe, they are sweet and delicious, yeah. and it's it's you know it's very very fruity. Not I I I, I did I've heard bad things about the crunchy guy. <laughs> it's very fermented. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Super cool. So with the fine like flavors of something like a person, yeah. How would you retain that? Right. That's a good question because we have that same question because when you taste a persimmon, at least the persimmons I tasted. It was very fruity. It was a bit of apricot in there, a bit of uh, you know grape, a bit of apple, and melon. Was just yeah. melon, yeah, um, just kind of general fruitiness, and it se- seemed really delicate. So the thing we thought would be an appropriate base beer was American wheat. Um, you know, not a lot of flavor, but you know, good carrier for for that kind of thing. We also figured it would turn out hazy uh, using <laughs> persimmons. And uh, so that's why we're just like, well, if you call it American wheat, it doesn't matter whether it's clear or hazy, it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. We didn't have to worry about it. So the persimmons, uh, we found a local cider maker that was willing to press a bunch of the persimmons into juice. And uh, Tony, you know, went around and the first guy, I guess, let him down and they, he trucked him over to another guy and he really did a lot of work on, on making that happen. It's really cool. Nice. Uh, so uh, in that kind of light, you know, character, we, we looked at that also. And we thought, well, you know, you could add in some other flavors uh, to, uh, you know, kind of enhance and complement that. And so if you did, you know, maybe you add some, some peach extract or some peach puree. Maybe you add a little bit of, you know, apple juice or something just to kind of enhance and lift that. You don't want to disrespect the, the, the 